So everyone, I'd like to welcome you all here today. We're chatting with uh, Porig Morn. Porig is um, a botcha player, which is an adapted game of bowls for athletes with cerebral palsy. Um, but we're actually going to chat today to Porig really about kind of growing up with cerebral palsy, kind of going to college, starting working life and a little bit about that. But I'll let Porig kind of do a little bit of an introduction to himself to start with. Yeah, my name is Porygon32. I've had um, CP since I was born. I'm just in the process of finishing a degree in communications. And at the moment, I'm working for Sky Ireland as a service advisor. And then I'm also an athlete ambassador for the Sky Sports Living for Sport program as well. Okay. So I guess really for us, Porig, um, so this is a Managing Children with Cerebral Palsy course. Um, but this week, we're kind of looking at that concept of into adulthood, of kind of leaving that childhood behind and kind of really the what next process. So maybe you could kind of fill us in a little bit maybe about just your school life in general as an overview and then really that transition kind of into college and then going on into work. Um, yeah, school for me was was a bit strange in a way. Um, when I was originally diagnosed with CP at 13 months, which was done in Marino School, which is now in Able Ireland, um, I was originally in school there till I was um, eight years old. And then one of the teachers kind of realised that I was really clever and it was just a purely physical disability. So they decided to try and try me in a mainstream primary school. So one day a week, I used to go over to St. Cronin's uh, just to get me ready and that was really developed then to move to full-time primary, which was St. Kevin's and Greystones. Now, that for me was a big change because I was so used to being around different people with different disabilities and people in wheelchairs. So going from being in that safe environment to being where you've got uh, 200 kids from in the yard was kind of a bit difficult. And when I was eight, or nine, there was really no adapted PE. So I was kind of in a position where I had to use either my walker or my crutches. So I played Gaelic football, I played hockey. I did everything because I didn't want to feel different. And I didn't want to feel like, oh, well, I can't do this. So I guess for me, primary school was, was generally okay. Once I'm in St. Kevin's, once I got used to the adjustment and, and having a kid running around me. And obviously I learned that there was some stuff I couldn't do. So then um, when I moved into secondary, that was kind of a bit difficult because the secondary, the secondary school I went to for the first two years, I got really badly bullied for being like for having a disability and having a laptop and things like that. Um, and the other students didn't particularly like me doing PE um, because they felt they got in the way. So that was really difficult for me because I loved doing sport and I hated not being able to do something. And so that was quite difficult for me. And then I, I think at that stage, I kind of realized, you know, I needed to find a sport um, that that I could, you know, play in an equal footing. And I, and I played Bacha when I was younger. So I decided to go back to Bacha at that point. And then obviously I moved schools at the end of second year where I was very, very happy then. And I got to do PE and I got to do all the fun things and I became happy again. But I suppose one of the biggest things I found in schools was teachers not understanding CP and not understanding, you know, whether I could or couldn't do something. They just decided, oh, well, you know, he can't do that. So I suppose that was one of the biggest challenges I found in school because there was no kind of uh, adapted curriculum or they just didn't understand because at that point, there wasn't many people with special needs in mainstream school when I was eight. I think I was one of the first in the country to do that. So it was difficult for me, but I'd say it was more difficult for the for the teachers themselves as well. Okay, what about that? So you kind of went through school life and kind of what, how did you find that transition from leaving school? So you had all those years, teachers eventually adapted to things. What was your transition then out of school? What did you kind of go on to? Did you go straight to college or what did you do when you finished school itself? Um, okay, so that was again, I seem to like doing things twice. So I went to do radio broadcasting and the only course that did it was the Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Dunleary and they only take in every two years. So what I did was when I finished my Leaving Cert, I did a post-Leaving Cert course in Dunleary College of Art Education for one year and then I moved over to IADT then to do my radio broadcasting course um, and that was a two-year course. 
I found college a bit easier because the supports were already there, like in terms of getting a laptop and a laptop and special needs equipment that I would have needed. So that was already there because they knew from the CAO. Whereas in secondary schools, it takes about three or four months because there's so many so much red tape that you've got to go through to get equipment and you to get quotes. But in college. It's generally a bit easier because they know in advance you're coming, so that all that equipment is is there as soon as you go in the door, basically. So that made it made a big difference. So equipment really it was quite a a big important need, kind of going into that transition. Yeah, for me, like because of my CP, I can write, but at about five minutes, I'm the only one that can read it because of of the tone in my hand and the fact I'm concentrating so hard, it gets worse. So for me, I definitely would needed a laptop. And for me in college, within secondary school, I would have fallen behind a little bit because I didn't get the equipment straight away. But in college, like I was able to start straight away and hit the ground running. Um, and in terms of then having um PAs in college that was a lot easier to access as well. Um, so that made my life a lot easier in terms of getting notes taken. Uh, whereas in schools, it's not as easy because they don't get the same level of funding or colleges have more funding. So it makes it easier to access and go through the, 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 the work process in terms of getting assignments done and getting research done. And I suppose the big thing for me then when I moved over to DCU, um, I got to live on campus over there. Um, now it's quite very hard to get personal care hours, um, to enable me to do that so I managed to get like 10 hours a week which is one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening so because my needs were, my personal care needs were so low then DC were able to double up that person with them um, with my academic hours so I had the one person with me for 30 35 hours a week so that made my life so much easier in terms of hitting the ground running and being able to not fall behind and being able to start straight away. So a big thing really is about looking at all the supports that you need to, to be able to do what everybody else is doing. It's the support structures behind it that probably really are one of the things that anyone in healthcare really should be looking at. Yeah, and the thing you will find is that um, when these things get cut, most people who made the cuts don't realise how vital they are. Those 10 hours to me in DCU were, were huge because if I didn't have them and I didn't have someone to help me put on my shoes and my socks um, or take something hot out of the oven, I wouldn't have been able to stay on campus and, uh, and you know, be a student and do all the fun things in town because I would have had to have commuted from Bright to Pally one every day and, and that just wouldn't have been feasible. So, yeah, the support structures are massive in terms of when they're in place, they, they really work. But um, because of cutbacks, you know, they're not always available, which is so wrong because it actually, it stops the someone with a disability that wants to progress into third level or or into employment, you know, they may not get that opportunity because the support structure isn't there. Yeah. What do you think, like, um, you know, as a child, you kind of had a, a lot more access to physiotherapy and kind of those healthcare services kind of that you need. How have you find found getting access to those kind of things as an adult? Has it been as easy to access them or is it something that just isn't really available when you become an adult? They're non-existent when you become an adult. Um, it's a case of that I want physio. I, I'm offered it once a month from the HSE, um, which isn't enough for me because obviously I'm quite active. And if I don't move around, I get very tight. So I try to go swimming and stuff to keep myself loose because even to if my crutches break, just for argument's sake, it takes them about six weeks to replace a set of crutches. So you can imagine what it's like to try and get a physio appointment if it takes them that long to um to get a set of crutches. So that system in itself is fundamentally wrong because rather than making it easy to access for someone with a disability who also may have a speech impairment who can't actually communicate on the phone, it's really difficult for it to actually access those services when you go past 18 and you've uh, saved out, outside of the Enable Ireland structure for CP, you know? Yeah, and and obviously for you, it's it's those support structures that make the difference between having that independence to do what you want or having to rely on family members to give you the support to do stuff. So then there's that impact it does have on the family if those support structures aren't in place. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things at the moment that I find is I still get my 10 hours a week Monday to Friday, but there's a thing with the HC at the moment where 
people with physical disabilities don't get weekend hours. So at the weekend, it's like I stay in bed and I don't go out. So I don't get them. So I'm trying to fight to get like four hours over the weekend. Because other than that, I have to make sure either my brother's here, my mom is here to put on my shoes. So from that point of view, you know, it's it's frustrating because it's very simple from it's a very simple thing for someone to put on a pair of shoes. For me, if I can't do it, I'm I'm stuck at home and that, that really annoys me. But unfortunately that's the system we're in. But at the moment that is the HSE um in terms of, of, of putting hours in place, you know. And so so with you, how about so you've started working now in the last couple of years. Um has has that been a big change for you in terms of your lifestyle, in terms of your managing your impairment on that day to day basis and balancing kind of that real work life balance? Yeah, um, I found it really tough because Sky have five shift rotations. So the first one starts at eight o'clock in the morning. So I use it to get up at half five to leave my house at half six to, or six to get the dart. So that was quite tough. So what Sky did was they reduced my my working hours down to 30 hours a week, which makes a big difference as well because it also allows me to train. But they, they've been really good in terms of the support structures they put in place um, in, in terms of trying to help me. But it was a bit of a, an adjustment, but I'm really, really glad that I have a job because I look at it now that, you know, I have a disability, but I don't need to be getting social welfare. And I'm really lucky in that regard and you know it gives not that I didn't have a purpose in life being an athlete but you know it's so great to know that you've worked hard and you, you've gone on a holiday or whatever and like for me like I, I like my job and a lot of people in call centers will say they hate it but I actually like my job so like it's a good place to work as well and they look after their staff and it was, it was just a bit tricky learning how to try and train around that and put other things in place and still uh, maintaining the athlete's healthy lifestyle and trying not to, you know, eat chocolate and drink lots of coffee because in a call centre, that's generally what happens. So that was the the challenge to learn how to, you know, manage my, my diet and stuff like that because obviously I get tired quicker. So it was a case of having to learn what I needed to eat, when I needed to eat. So it was a case of just uh, of just retraining myself and retraining my, my body for the travel and the, the environment that I was in. Okay, so really it is about just giving yourself that time to adapt to that new environment and kind of setting up the structures around it. Did you find that recovery initially was quite a hard thing? And what kind of things might you have used to help with the recovery of this new working lifestyle? Yeah, I was I was knackered sometimes because when you were getting up at like five o'clock in the morning and it was like lashing rain, it was like, oh, you know. But for me, once the weekend came, uh, by a Friday, I would think I'd be in bed by eight or nine o'clock. So just to recover over the weekend, or or even just to go for a swim, or just you know to watch DVD and just not do anything on a Saturday. Uh, at the start, initially, I didn't really have weekends because I was so tired. Whereas now I'm in the full swing of it. I know the shift patterns. You know it doesn't. Yeah, I'm tired, but I'm not as tired because my body is used to doing it. And obviously with CP, it's it's all muscle memory. So my body's used to doing that now, so it's not it's not a big toll. But for the first few months, it was it was pretty tough until until I adapted of of commuting in there to work every day. With with your cerebral palsy, do you have you noticed any changes as you're getting older, or things that have kind of become more difficult um, as you've gotten older, or likewise things that have become a little bit easier as you're getting older? Um, tougher, I suppose. Not as such because I keep myself really active. Like I use my chair, but I walk around. I try to keep myself fit. Um, so I don't think things have really got um tougher. What I probably noticed more um is things like accessibility um has improved a little bit. But I find having travelled to many different countries at the Paralympics that Ireland is still very backward in terms of how it treats somebody with. A physical disability or speech impairment so I kind of am a bit more conscious of that and probably what needs to change and how bad the structures are when you look at them, like places like the UK or the US um, what they have in place or even going to Paris in terms of traveling around Paris in a power chair it's so much easier than, than, than it is in Ireland it's so much more difficult and it should be easier in Ireland now but it actually can prove to be more difficult 
is there any advice you would give to kind of people working within the healthcare industry of how they could help support a child with cerebral palsy who's kind of making that transition into adult life? Is there any key bits of support or information you think that they should be sharing that makes that transition a little bit easier? I think a big thing for people within the HSE, and I don't think, I'm not sure if it's widely done, but they need to consult with people with disabilities that are actually on the ground because a lot of people within the HSE sit in an office and they're making decisions. So I suppose for me, you know, a bit more consultation with people with disabilities would make life so much easier. I understand that they've got budgets to keep, but ultimately if you can, if you know what's going to work and you speak to someone with a disability, they're the best people that are going to be able to help you guide the HSE and guide people with in terms of putting in support structures and putting in those vital services which are required, you know, rather than just saying, well, well, we're going to do a generic thing across the board, which is kind of what happens now, which is when we run into problems in Ireland. We, we kind of do things and then we retrospectively go back and go, eh, that's not going to work. And then we go back and fix the problem that we've created because we've, we've created a problem by not actually consulting with people that may affect. Okay. Yeah, so I think that is really, really, I think, quite a, a vital point. It is about actually consulting people who have the impairment. You know, if you're making decisions or you're kind of going to do something that might impact on them, is having their involvement in those decisions really is quite a key thing in ensuring that it does cater for them as their their needs are changing. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, one example is I've just got an assistance dog and it's taken two and a half years and one of the things I, I've come away, become more aware of now is they don't get any government funding. And for me, having Gail, it's made life so much easier in terms of if I drop something in my chair when I'm out, she can retrieve it or she can help open a door if I need her to. But like something like that, which would be a vital service, like the charity also provides stability dogs. And I've come across young kids who have CP who literally weren't able to walk until they got a stability dog, yet this charity get no no funding and they've three full-time staff and they've had to close their waiting list so for a vital service like that that like if if that service had been around when i was younger who knows i might have been more stable on my feet but for me that's a vital service that gets go no government funding that can literally make such a difference to somebody's life yeah so it is about this whole mix of, of services so gail um has she made quite a big difference to your life since getting her she has and she's just put up her head to say hello, Gail. There you go. There's Gail. So Gail has made such in terms of in terms of making a difference to my life, yeah. Because she also gives me security coming home late at night. But as, as well as that, um like for me, it does happen that I would drop a pen and work because obviously I um I might knock things off the desk and she'll just pick it up naturally for me and it saves me having to do it. But again, when I see, um, like, Gail's sister is a stability dog for a seven-year-old who never walked before she got the dog. And then one night her parents went to her room and she was like, I have to walk before I get the dog. So she knew this dog was coming. So she started to actually push herself to learn how to walk. So for me, that's another vital service that, you know, is going to make such a difference to somebody's life that, that has CP and that, you know, it's going to get more stable walking and you know, that's something that needs to be looked at, that vital services like this may need government funding and they just don't get it. And one final thing, Porik, if, if you were to give advice to um, anyone with cerebral palsy who's in about to make that transition into adulthood, into kind of really what that next stage out of school and, and growing up, what advice would you give them as an individual with cerebral palsy? People are always going to tell you that you can't do something. Um, my mum and dad always tell me when I was going to walk out words, I can't. So, you know, you're going to get knockbacks. That happens. It happens to able-bodied people as well. But you've just, got to, you've just got to keep at it because ultimately I was always told I'd never get a job in radio. I'd never be able to walk. I'd never do anything. But, you know, when someone says to me I can't do something, it's like a red rag to a bull. So I'll just keep pushing on and I'll prove people wrong. So I guess because there's so many different types of CP and different variations of it, people do assume that if you've got a physical impairment, you're not going to be able to do something. So I guess my thing was I always show people 
do you want a bet that I can't do it? And I never gave up and I kept at it till I actually got it. So that would be my piece of advice to them. I think that is a really, really useful piece of advice. Well, Porik, I would like to say thank you really very much um, for chatting to us today. I think it's great for kind of all our healthcare professionals doing the course just to really start to think about that, you know, yes, you it's about managing a child with cerebral palsy, but what about the, the, the next phase? It's like, how do we help them yeah. transition into life beyond school, beyond where you have more access to therapy and what can we do to support them? So thank you very much for all of that. I think it'd be really beneficial for all of our, um, our people on the course. No problem at all.